Last Sunday morning, in the first service, 15 people crossed the line of faith and started their spiritual journey with Christ. And in the second service, 27 people. And in the third service, 35 people crossed the line of faith. Isn't that great? And you're probably sitting there going, wow, that must have been some message. <laughs> it's the gospel, and here's what's true. The reason one out of ten people who came in last Sunday crossed the line of faith is because you invited them, and you prayed for them, and you loved them enough to want them to experience the grace of God for themselves. And we think that's a really big deal. So I want to thank you so much that you extended that invitation. You felt this was a safe enough place for them to come. And you know what I believe? I believe there were probably that many who didn't take that step yet, but they've taken a step by just showing up. And how many believe God can continue to lead and guide them until they're for a part of his forever family? We're continuing on in our series called Interrupted, and I'm in Mark, the ninth chapter. And uh, it says, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? How many know these are not encouraging words? <laughs> And, and Jesus says this. By the way, he's not talking to the dad or the boy. He's, he's talking to people that he hoped would be able to step into that situation with faith. So they brought him the boy, and, and when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion, and he fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Um, in our culture, we're uncomfortable with conversations about faith. That is considered an intensely private matter. And so public conversations about faith make people a little bit anxious. Although in our culture, they do expect you to be very open about every other aspect of your life, including your sexuality. There is also a tendency among Christians to not openly discuss challenges of doubt when we're struggling to uh, hold on to a faith because of some things that we're going through. The question naturally becomes, if our culture is uncomfortable with the conversation and the church can be uncomfortable with the conversation, where can we have it? And the good news is the Bible is not silent on these kinds of issues. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can interrupt doubt today. And I want to start by understanding this, is that doubt is not refusing to believe. It is more a lack of certainty about what you believe. It's not a position of, I won't believe anything. It's just that there are things that you've held and you're, you're less certain of them now. Maybe some issues of your faith have become a little confusing or disorienting to you. Maybe you feel like you're slipping or losing some traction or some ground. 
And here's the other thing I want you to see this morning is that everyone experiences doubt. Everyone experiences doubt. There's no spiritual level where you are going to get to where you don't doubt anymore. By the way, it's not just religious people that experience doubt. Atheists experience doubt. They have a position, and then sometimes they wonder and they worry. You know, what if I'm wrong about this? Everyone experiences doubt. So the question is, what triggers doubt? What causes it to kind of surface? Is this just a random thing, or are there elements that might facilitate it kind of showing up in our lives? And the first is this. It often happens when bad things happen to good people. Someone you know and you love, someone who works hard, they're faithful, they're honest, they're loyal, uh, they care for their family, they're generous, they're just, there's so much about them that's admirable and our world would be so benefited if there were more people like this and then they seem to be the ones that when it rains it just pours on and they get some of the worst news in the world and when that happens, we don't just feel like that's sad. We feel like that's not fair. And that, that argument of fairness that begins to percolate up in our thinking begins to create some doubt. There's another trigger, and that is when good things happen to bad people. People who manipulate and abuse others, people who will cheat the system, they lack integrity, they'll, and, uh, they'll try to take advantage of those who are weak, and they seem to get good things, and they get all the breaks in life, and we just go, what's up with this? You know, you're not alone, by the way. The psalmist David actually has an incredible song that he wrote about this in the Old Testament, and he said, when I saw how prosperous the wicked was, I lost my traction in my own spiritual journey. I felt like I was falling. And he had to walk through a whole spiritual process in order to be able to feel like he had his, his feet back under him. Now, this is the thing. I've, I have observed that um, anyone can experience a tragedy in life. That putting your faith in God, owning a Bible, showing up on frequent basis in rooms like this doesn't exempt you from real life. Everybody's going to face challenges. That's not the surprise to me. The surprise to me is that sometimes that tragedy seems to erode people's faith, and sometimes the tragedy seems to strengthen their faith. I've seen people walk through the most unbelievable things, and they come out the other side, and it's, there's no sense of denial. But what they learned about God and themselves and His work in their lives through that process just drew them all the closer to Him. This is why it's important for us to know that faith and doubt do exist at the same time. We often struggle with this. We want to eliminate any doubt because we perceive that somehow it's unpleasing to God, where it corrupts our capacity to be used by God. But here's what I want you to know. You cannot eliminate the existence of either faith or doubt, but you can decide which one of those things you will follow. That's the essential thing to, to understand. I, I have to admit, it is easier to doubt than to believe. And by the way, you can feel even a little bit more intellectual by doubting than by believing. Most people consider believing to be an exercise of naivete. And sometimes if we're doubting, we feel like if I was just smarter, I could figure this out. And so we wonder if we're smart enough for our faith. And it's easy to surrender to the idea that maybe our faith isn't strong enough. But, but here's something I want you to understand. A lot of people think, well, then I'll live without doubt or without faith. I'll just go neutral, and then my life will, won't be ruined either way. But what I want you to know is that that's really not an option, because actual living in a real world requires actual choices, and those choices are largely driven by concepts of doubt or faith. And the stakes are astonishingly high. I mean, what if there really is a God? What if there really is an eternity? What if this is just something that we go through and what happens after this is the most important thing? That's worth trying to figure out. That's worth trying to understand. And here's the thing. To be neutral, you just have to stay home and you have to escape all of life, and that's not an option. Now, some people choose doubt over belief. 
So they will not join any causes because those causes probably aren't going to accomplish their goal. They never vote for any leader because that leader's probably going to fail. They won't be able to keep their promises. They won't exercise any generosity because the money probably won't go where it's supposed to or it probably won't accomplish what they want it to. And so there's this, it's just easier to, to be in doubt. But the simple truth is, is that we have to choose. Neutral's not an option, and doubt is easier. This is what I will tell you. For example, uh, we've had people get married, and when people get married, I will tell you that is an exercise of faith. It is. I mean, just statistically, when you look at how many marriages don't make it, but they stand there, and they, they make incredible promises to each other for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others till death us do part. I mean, th these are statements of faith. I've never had anybody stand there and say, I, I doubt this is going to go long. I, I doubt... <laughs> I doubt I'm going to be able to keep up this charade. I doubt. I've just, you know, nobody. And, and you can back it all the way up. If you doubt that there's ever a person that you could spend the rest of your life with and love more than you love yourself, you will never ask anybody out. If you do ask them out and you doubt that they have the character or the capacity to be able to do a life together in a way that makes it meaningful, you will never ask them for a greater level of commitment. Our world is filled full of people who are making decisions on doubt and they try to sell it as some kind of intellectual superiority. They're just afraid. They're scared to death of life and they don't want to look naive and they don't want to look stupid, so they exercise options that they think protect them. And it does. It protects you from life. But it doesn't protect you from disappointment, and it doesn't protect you from loneliness, and it doesn't protect you from fear. It's a challenging situation. So is faith a way to kind of calculate what's more likely to happen? Absolutely not. And faith isn't just about what happens after you die. Faith is about how you live every single day. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. What does faith look like? And faith kind of has three faces that people wear. And the first is what we want others to think we believe. It's not as though you don't actually believe it, but you say things to others because you want to identify how you think about something, where your faith is, what your convictions are. And, and, and so you share that to people. And then there are things that we... we we sincerely think we believe. You know, this is what I actually hold on to. And here's what I want you to know. Sometimes we get surprised that we don't actually believe what we thought we believe. For example, you probably know this guy in the New Testament. His name was Peter. He was one of the three closest followers of Jesus. And just before Jesus' crucifixion, just before his arrest, he's standing there telling Jesus, these other guys, they may be cowards. These other guys, they may forsake you, but not me. I will lay my life down. I will go to the end for you, Jesus. And you know something? He's not pretending when he says that. He believes it's true. But then the pressure comes, and all of a sudden, it becomes harder to say what he once believed was true. He becomes very afraid. So when people are expressing their views to another or people are holding convictions in their heart, these are all valuable and good things. These are not bad. But we have to know it's not enough. There's a third face for faith, and it's what we act on. It's what we act on. If you believe that touching a hot stove is an unwise thing to do, there's a way you will act around that stove. If you believe that gravity will pull you to the ground, you will not try to float off the top of a building. You see, when we put actions to something, what, what does it look like to put actions to the belief that God really is with you every single minute of every single day? What would actions look like if we really did believe it's better to give than it is to receive? What would, what would our actions look like if we really believe that faith wasn't just something we thought or said, but it's how we live? And uh, people can, this is what I would tell you, if you look at people's actions, you will see what they really believe. There's a lot of consistency to this. They won't say it, but it is what they believe. Just watch some people, and this is their faith statements. 
I believe lying is a bad thing, but it can be useful in avoiding pain. Some people, you watch them, I believe it pays to be nicest to the people who are wealthy and attractive and smart and athletic and successful and important. Just watch the actions of some people and their belief statement is, I believe that I have the right to pass judgment on others. Just watch the actions of some people and their faith statement is, I believe I have the right to gossip about people. Just watch the actions of some people and their faith statement will be, I believe that 30,000 children dying of preventable diseases every day in our world are not worth my risking my affluence for. Actions speak louder than our words. And what I will tell you is, our actions do reveal what we actually believe. See, Jesus' actions were always consistent with his words. He believed his father was always with him and always loved him. So even in the most dire situations, you don't see him questioning that or saying something else. Even where bad things were happening, he didn't question his father's love. He actually believed that forgiving was better and more powerful than vengeance. So even on the cross, he's able to pray, Father, forgive them. He actually believed that generosity was better than hoarding. He didn't leave a large estate so that other people could enjoy it. He shared everything that he had. Once they this is fascinating. Once you place your faith in Jesus, you begin to experience the faith of Jesus. And you begin to walk out this incredible truth that God is real, and he is great, and he is good, and he is powerful, and he is at work. And when you start acting on that faith, it's astonishing what a difference it makes. And it's why Jesus was so attractive to people, because everybody thinks things, and everybody says things. But Jesus' words, thoughts, and actions all lined up all the time. Sometimes we feel like we have greater faith when we hear an inspirational talk. Or maybe we feel like we have greater faith when we see a brand new baby born into this world. But what I can tell you is other people also find their faith when they're having to endure the most painful and excruciating circumstances of life. Here's what I want you to know. Don't try to find a faith that's without a doubt. Look for a faith that has hope. If you're looking for a faith that you never doubt anything, you're wasting your time. But if you're looking for a faith that can always give hope, then Jesus has a lot to offer. So that's where we get to the story. I know you were wondering why I read the scripture and then I seem to have ignored it. That was my introduction. And the good news, this message is almost all introduction today. But Jesus and his closest followers were returning from a significant spiritual encounter on top of a mountain. And in fact, it came to be known as the Mount of Transfiguration. And uh, this is what we know, is you can't actually live on mountaintops like that. And by the way, you can't do ministry there either. You have to come where real people are, and Jesus and his followers do. And as he's coming down the mountain, he's approached by a father, and this father is desperate. He has a son that he loves very much, but his son is tormented by a demonic force. And I know what some people think. There are some people, you're, you're very well-educated, you're well-read, you're sophisticated, and you read something like that in your scripture, and you go, that's just what annoys me about the Bible and about Christianity. Is This is a kid with a physical challenge, and, and, and they just chalk it up to some kind of mystical, demonic thing. And, and that's why I have so much trouble. Like I like when Jesus talks about how to care for others and all that, but, but when you get into this, it had to be a demon thing. And here's what I want you to know. Jesus never said that every sickness was a demon, and in fact, he didn't treat them like they were. He actually asks some follow-up questions, and he discerns something that's critical to the information he gathers in this. This young man, in addition to not being able to speak, he also had some other challenges. He would go into convulsions, but it was very interesting. It wasn't just some kind of a seizure or a convulsion. It would happen when he was around water or fire. And he would fall into the water, and he would fall into the fire, and he was constantly almost losing his life. See, Jesus knows that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. This wasn't just a physical thing. This is some demonic force that wants to destroy this young boy's life. And so the father had asked Jesus' disciples to cast this demon out, and they tried 
but they couldn't. And so there were some doctors of the law around who then started having a theological argument with them about whether or not they should be able to do this and wasn't this just for God. And so the crowd is insulting them and the disciples are embarrassed and defensive and everyone breaks up into an argument, which is exactly what happens when Christians get embarrassed and defensive. Every time you hear a Christian arguing, assume they failed at something and they're trying to cover it up with an argument. This is why our world hasn't been reached by grace yet. And Jesus comes in and he says, what are you arguing about? And, uh, well, the dad is there and, and he comes up and he tells Jesus. And as he brings the boy, the, the son just goes into a, another convulsion. And Jesus did a couple follow-up questions. And then, this is what the father says. If you can do anything. Take pity on us and help us. If is not a word of certainty. If is not the word people use when they have strong convictions. But this father, he's at the end of his rope. He has prayed every prayer he knows to pray, and nothing has happened. He has made every promise he can make to God, and nothing has happened. He has promised to give whatever he has, and nothing has happened. He has taken this boy to other religious leaders, and nothing has happened. Every time, he winds up with the same thing, nothing. And have you any idea how painful it is to try to find a little bit of hope one more time after so many years but there weren't any other options. So he tries one more time. He's gotten used to people staring at his son. He's gotten used to people whispering about him. He's gotten used to people creating distance from him and his boy. He's gotten used to parents pulling their children away and protecting them. And so he just blurts out to Jesus, if there is anything you can do, please have pity on us. And Jesus responds with, by saying, if everything is possible to him who believes. And that's when we get the most amazing and honest answer and prayer you could ever possibly hear. He doesn't say, let me retract my previous statement. I want to amend my remarks. He doesn't try to hide the inner conflict that's going on inside of him. This man who has iffy faith prays an iffy prayer. And what he says is, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I believe and I doubt. I hope and I'm afraid. I pray and I waver. I ask and I worry. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And if Jesus could have any loophole to use as an excuse to create distance from this guy, he could say it right then. He could just say, you know, when you get your faith act together, when you make a little more progress, you bring this boy back and then I'll do something. But that is not Jesus' response, and it never is. He speaks to the boy, and the boy is healed, and now the boy is going to live, and the boy is going to grow up, and the boy is going to learn a trade, and the boy is going to have a family of his own, and this boy is going to remember every single day for the rest of his life that an iffy father with an iffy faith and an iffy prayer met a young teacher who made all the difference in the world in his life. That's what he learned. That's what he learned. He'll always remember that. So no matter what you're going through, there's something inside of you that still has the capacity to hope. You can still pray. You can still search scripture, scripture. You can still show up in rooms like this. The reason we are attracted to Jesus is because his thoughts and his words and his actions, they always lined up. Maybe God really is as good as Jesus said. And maybe he's as powerful as he proved to be in the resurrection of his son. And something inside of you tells you, you really do have an alternative to despair. That's what Jesus comes to do. Now, one day, we'll know. Right now, you can't see it. We can't figure it out. But one day, we will know, and one day, we will see it. But until that day, we can have hope, and we can pray if he prayers. You don't have to hide your doubt, but it doesn't have to control you either. 
That's what God wants us to know today. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And um, I know in a room like this, there are going to be some people, life for you right now is going pretty well. You have enough or more than enough resources to take care of your needs. You have friends that when you get together, there's lots of laughter. You have family that actually look like they're happy when you walk in the door at the end of the day. Your body's holding up. There's other people in the room. There's some challenges. Maybe financially there's a struggle. Maybe friends seem to be too few right now. There's not a lot of people you can open up to. And when you do, it's not laughter that happens, it's more tears. And maybe, maybe physically some things have occurred that make you wonder about the quality of your life or the quantity of your life. And here's what I want you to know. Jesus will never ask you to pretend one thing, celebrate the good times when they happen, hug friends and love them and laugh with them. But when friends are few and your body is breaking down and your family tries to avoid you, you don't have to pretend any of it. And you may not feel like you have a great amount of hope or a great amount of faith, but you can pray an iffy prayer with iffy faith and watch a great God do great things. So I'm going to do something a little bit more unusual today. I'm going to ask that uh, if you're in the room and you feel like you're in a situation where it's really difficult, it's challenging, it could be a financial, a physical, an emotional, a spiritual, it doesn't really matter what arena it's occurring in, but it's really difficult. I'm just going to ask you to stand right where you are. I promise I won't embarrass you, but I want you to know you're in a safe place and you can stand right where you are. And I'm so thrilled to see you standing because I know God's heart towards those who don't pretend anything. Now, all of you who are seated, I'm going to ask you to stand and move towards someone who's nearby who is standing and just place your hand on their shoulder. I'm not going to ask you to yell at them or shake them or do anything. Just, I want them to know they're in a community that even if they can't see a good thing God can do, we're willing to pray for it anyway together. Heavenly Father, your son tells us how good you are and his actions, they never wavered. Even in excruciating pain, and experiencing the rage of governments and religious systems. He still cried and called out to you because he knew you were there. Would you help us experience that your presence is with us today too? We do ask for whatever the financial challenges, the emotional challenges, the physical challenges, or the spiritual challenges to be resolved. We ask for miracles today because you are a God who can do absolutely anything. Nothing is impossible to you, and everything is possible to those who have faith. And so we do ask for that today. But between now and the moment that that prayer is answered in full, I ask that they would sense your presence, and I ask that they would experience your peace, and I ask that they would be able to accumulate the strength that you pour into them today. And I ask that they be able to experience hope that it's not always going to be like this. We may not be able to see how you're going to work it out, but you are at work and you are good. And we trust you and we believe you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone who agreed with that prayer said, Amen. Amen.